Craig and this is Rox. We work for the Far North District Libraries up here in Titai Tukarau. We are coming to you today from the beautiful Kaikohe Library. We are so excited about this year's New Zealand Children and Young Adults Picture Book Awards and we'd like to give a big shout out to our friends at Lianza and the New Zealand Book Awards Trust for making this event possible. We're stoked to be making this video and even more stoked to be chatting with our friend Ruth Paul. Hello! <laughs> Ruth is the creator of loads of great kids books including Bad Dog Flash, uh, The King's Bubbles um, and Cookie Book just to name a few. The newest book, Lion Guards the Cake, is the finalist in the 2022 New Zealand Book Awards for, who, for Children and Young Adults Picture Book category. That's one of our favourite categories. <laughs> um, this book was published by Scholastic New Zealand and written and illustrated by Ruth. And the pictures and the writing are amazing. Um, so yeah, any, without any more chatting from us, let us introduce you to Ruth Paul. Hi, Ruth. Hello. 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 I thought I'd um, talk to you today from my paddock because <laughs> it's a beautiful day here in Wellington. You wouldn't really believe it. Um, and it's just, you know, it's nice to get outside every now and then. And I'm hoping that while I'm talking, my pet sheep won't come and annoy me, but it's quite possible. So we're hoping they're like lions. They like to take over <laughs> when they get a chance, just saying. <laughs> nice. Cool. Ruth, can you tell us a little bit about Lion Guards the Cake? What's it about? Sure. Um, I guess I was thinking about, I just had one little rhyme in my head when I was starting to write it. And I was thinking of that phrase, the house is quiet, no one's awake, and Lion Guards the Cake. And it sort of, I just thought, I thought there was something really funny in that idea and that I could maybe work with that. But I wondered always why a lion would be guarding a cake. And I had to really think about how I got this lion into a house to guard a cake. Or was the cake at the zoo? Or uh, had the lion escaped from somewhere? And I was walking through um, my own sort of area, you know, in Northland in the city. And I saw this house that had a big lion sitting above the gate guarding the house. And I thought, that's my lion. You know, there's no reason that that lion can't come to life at night and take it upon himself to be... Uh, a special guardian of something that he particularly likes, such as cake. So, <laughs> kind of how it came about, the idea. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That is so great. I, we've, we've actually got a, a lion statue somewhere up here, I think, in Kitty Kitty as well. Hey, um, just hearing you do that little snippet of the house was quiet, no one was awake. Um, I love listening to e audiobooks, um, especially when the book is read by the author. I feel like there's something really magical about hearing the words. Um, read by the person who wrote them. Um, do you have a copy of Lion Guards the Cake on you? Would you be happy to read us a, a couple of your favourite pages? Do you know what? Because I'm in the paddock, I actually don't have a copy on me, <laughs> which is really daft, isn't it? But I can probably remember it enough. Oh, yeah, nice. Let's I wonder see, if we can you find the picture papers. Yeah. Picture books are really short. They're like poems sometimes. You know, often they're only 700 words or less. Um, so it's possible that it's still in my head from writing it. So I'll have a go. It goes... Lion sits above the yard, hour by hour keeping guard. But in the dusk he slips his post quietly, like a golden ghost, and goes to where he's needed most. The house is quiet, no one's awake, and Lion guards the cake. Through the hallway, dimly lit, little by little, bit by bit, the mice creep up a little bit more. They tiptoe under the kitchen door where they see a big fat. Paw! They skitter and scatter across the floor. Lion checks the cake. He licks the clum crumbs from round the plate and gently pats the edges straight. Then, once again, you get the idea. It carries on and he protects the cake from lots of different invaders who want to have a piece of cake. And it's possible that Lion is like a little bit interested in the cake himself, but you know, <laughs> I'll leave, let the reader work that out. <laughs> Yes, thank you. Oops. Cool. You are the illustrator and the author, which is quite rare. Normally people write books, but they get someone else to do the pictures. What yeah, bit do you um, do first? The pictures or the writing? Often it's the words for me. I think I need something that, or the idea, I need a concept that I know is going to have some meat on its bones, something that I can work with. And once I've thought of 
an idea that's kind of interesting or intriguing I tend to see if there's a way I can write it like if it's a uh, written in just you know non-rhyming language or is it an early reader or is it something that's funny and witty or is it naughty I try and think of what it's going to feel like and then I write words to sort of go with that and the hardest bit for me is always the ending trying to work out how I should tie something up so often if you're really lucky you can start a book by knowing what the ending is before you begin but um, mm -hmm. with Lion I had to really work that through in lots of different ways and I had lots of different endings before I settled on one and one of my endings I tried out on a small child and it made them cry. So I figured that was that was a bad ending. Um, funnily enough, it's because they thought Lion was too naughty, that, that he didn't get his just desserts. So I thought, gosh, I, I forgot about that sense of justice that children can have. You know, often it's much more attuned than ours is as adults because we're so old and grey. But um, yeah, no, it was started with the words because often I think you can do all sorts of amazing pictures for a story but if the story's not solid then you know the pictures kind of you know can't really help that yeah 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 no, well you did a great a great job hey I'm going off Meg and I actually put together a bit of a script and I'm going off the script um but sometimes when Meg and I and the team up here in the far north are uh, reading to kids we will ask kids do you think that this character is is ten or pie thumbs up a good guy or kore pie a terrible a baddie and um, can you tell us what do you think about is lion is lion uh, um, um lovely or a rat bag what do you think Ah, oh, see, I quite like Lion because I like sort of naughty characters in some ways. Um, but I think he just has self-interest, like we all do. He's, he's kind of keen to try and get one up for himself if he can, you know. Um, but he's neither good nor bad. There's a point in the story where he really tries to make things right, and he probably isn't very successful at that, <laughs> not giving anything away. But ultimately, he just likes cake, like we all do. So mm -hmm. I think... Lion, more than anything, is self-interested, and I think it's a characteristic that lots of us have. Lion is a little bit aware of it, but not fully aware of it. So it's kind of good to be aware yourself when, you know, <laughs> you're acting out of your own selfish desires. Uh, and, yeah, just to know Absolutely. That. So, when, when we've had classes before, there's always, always one kid who you say, what do you think, lovely or rat bag, that does this? So perhaps that ah. perhaps the official answer is, is a bit of both. <laughs> exactly that you're that kid hey um can you tell us we have kind of touched on this already but can you tell us kind of what inspired you to write about this concrete lion like where where was this lion is, is it a real lion on your street or um it's a lion oh, you see I better not give away this person's address because they don't even know that I stole their lion except they do know because they're near a pizza shop in Northland so people park up there and you get to see the lion on the gate and when, I'm, when I realized that Lion was shortlisted for the book awards, I said to my friend who was visiting, I went, oh, we've got to go over there and get a photo of us under the, the stone lion. And we knocked on this fellow's door and he was really charming. At first he thought we were trying to sell him some, some product. And a book. Sort of, <laughs> yeah, I was standing there holding a book going, I've written a book with a lion in it. And he was going, are you mad? Um, and then he let us in the pouring rain take photos under his lion and was actually art directing the whole thing after a while. So that was, that was pretty cool. So, yeah, um, but they're everywhere. Like we have lions on the cenotaph in Wellington, you know, the war memorial down by Parliament. And often they're there guarding the tomb of the unknown soldiers. Um, so lions in history, when I write a story, I always think about what cultural references or historical references the character might already have or the idea might already have. So, yeah, with lions, there's, um, there's a lot of lion guardianship stuff in Chinese history as well. Often you see the golden lions and one of them has their foot on a golden ball. Um, and they, they're they both male and I can't work out how they work. I have to remember that. But I went through and read all the different things about lions who were guardians and how they're thought of before I kind of stepped in and wrote my character. Oh, okay. Should we just do one thing? If I call Larry over, you can have one shot of me and my pet sheet. Very ancient yeah. one. Great. Larry, Larry, come here. He comes like a dog. He just comes on over. Do you give him cookies or something? <laughs> I'll just see if he'll come over. Come on, Larry. Come on. What is happening, Larry? Yes, get up. Go on. Come say hello to everyone. I know you've got a sore foot. I know. I'm sorry. I will stop this soon as long as you can see Larry. He's very handsome with a very sore foot. Oh, yeah. Nice coloring. Hello, Larry. 
Hi, Larry. Hello, Larry. Beautiful. How are you? Hello. Are you yeah, he's beautiful. Oh, sorry. This is my other pet sheep. Obama. Get it? Obama. Obama. <laughs> <laughs> we have loads of pose sculptures and statues up here in Northland. And ever since we've read Lion Guards the Cake, we've been noticing them more and more. And the stories behind the statues is what we want to find out. We want to show you some of our favourites now. And so we reached out to some of our friends here in Northland and asked them what they thought the, the meaning behind the statues are. Yeah, cool. So we're going to actually cut to um, a video now. So we have three. Um, and so our friends are going to show you uh, a statue that they've found up here in Northland, tell you a little bit about their statue or what they think about the statue. And then they're going to ask you a question. So we'll we'll cut to our first one. Um, our good mate, Anahida. Um, kia ora, Anahida. Hi, Ruth. I'm Anahida. And I have this sculpture at the end of our driveway. Well, this Manaya, I'm pretty sure it would eat like food from an ha a hangi, like potatoes, kumara, pig, meat, and it um it's like guards our house. Do you think would be a better guardian than the lion? Yes. <laughs> I drew this picture of um, my Manaya. I loved your book too. Yeah. Do you have any sculptures at your house around or around town? Um, I have lots of them around the town, um, none at my house because I'm on a farm and much as I would love to have a huge sculpture park, I don't. Um, often I find amazing bits of driftwood at the beach though too and they, you know, you can almost turn them into sculptures in your garden. And, um, but no, I just, I just, the lions I've been thinking of have been ones I've seen over time in different towns and cities and on different gates of different buildings. The New York Public Library even has two great big lions on either side of the front stairs as you go up to the library. So they're everywhere. Next, our friends Dayton and Anaru from Kawakawa are going to show you a statue that they love on top of the Kawakawa Library. Sure, Ruth. My name's Dayton. My name's Anaru. So the bird up there is protecting the library and eating the books. And it is flat. It might be flying around at night. I think it was like, crowns, maybe? Uh, pencils? Yeah. Ruth, how did you draw these pictures and how did you colour them? Hi. Have a good time. Ah, oh, Dayton and Anaru, that was amazing. And I'm pretty sure that Tui does keep all the bugs out of books because we don't want bugs in books. You know, they chew up all the paper. That's no good at all. <laughs> um, now your question was, um, your question was, just remind me. <laughs> how do you do that? How do you do the pictures? What oh, medium do you use? Spouts yes. or paint? Do you know, for this book, I did the pictures in pretty well everything when I started. I tried, I, I sketched it out in pencil. I did one really sort of, no, a couple of really complex pencil drawings that I colored in on the computer. Then I simplified everything down and I ended up with very much a, a computer drawn, um, sort of almost like an animated character and style. And to do that, I work on a big thing like a big iPad called a Cintiq where I can draw into a big screen. And I use Photoshop on the computer to do all that drawing. You, it used to be in the old days that you draw on one thing and look at a screen up here and draw with your hand down the bottom. So you're sort of doing a whole hand eye coordination thing. But now you just draw straight in. It's like you draw and procreate on an iPad or, um, oh. yeah. So, yeah. So they're all done on the computer in the end. A digital pencil. Yes, yeah. Oh, so cool. I'm still trying to learn to use a digital pencil and procreate on iPad, but I work in Photoshop on a Mac with a Cintiq drawing tablet, yeah. So if you if you want to have 
um, good drawing skills when you're older, keep up your digital skills or try and learn them as well, because it's really important in animation or film work or artwork for employment to, to get those digital skills as well as your drawing skills through college. Awesome. Great tip. Thanks, Ruth. Yeah, we actually have um, a collection up here, and I'm sure lots of libraries across New Zealand are, are kind of moving into that sort of digital space more and more. We have a collection of iPads and Apple Pencils. So sometimes after school, um, Meg will pull out the Apple Pencils and everyone has a... Yep. No, it's really cool. We might have thought that's how you did it, just identifying some of the brushes that you've used in your illustrations. Yeah. Can I come up and do a, you know... Have a class yeah. at your library? Oh, yeah. <laughs> For a cool illustration workshop, yeah. No, I mean, I want to learn how to do it properly off you. <laughs> oh, no, we want you to show up. <laughs> We have one more video for you now, um, and this is kind of, it was originally just going to be um, one one friend of ours, Heath, and then his little sister, Imo, thought she'd like to jump in, and then they had some friends over, and so we we um, asked if, yeah, every, everyone, everyone kind of jumped in on this interview question, so we're just going to play mm -hmm. this video now, so this is um, Heath and Imo, and Kaya and Kingston. Kia ora, Kia ora, my name is Kingston. Kia ora, my name is Kaya. Hi, my name is Emma Jen. Here in Taipa we have this Mamaru Waka. One time a chief called Tumuana had travelled from Aotearoa back to his home, Hawaiki. He had met a brave warrior, Parata who was also a chief. He wanted to send Parata to Aotearoa to protect his daughter Kahutia Nui. So Tumuana gave Tenana, the waka, to Parata and, it was, and they changed the name to be Mamaru. Parata then sailed to Aotearoa and found Kahutia Nui and protected her. And then after that, they got married and they formed the tribe Ngāti Kahu. And that's the story. Hi Rose, I just wanted to ask you a question. What books do you like to read to children or what books do you like to make? Like, do you want to make animal books or um, nature books or food books? Or maybe you can even make a book about a school. Awesome. Thanks, you guys. That was a great question. So, Ruth, yeah, what, what things do you like to write about? Well, firstly, can I say Heath, Imo, Kaya and Kingston, what amazing storytelling. I just, that's, that's, thank you. I'm honored to hear that story. And um, what do I like to read? I love to read, if it's picture books, things that roll off your tongue. If I'm reading it aloud to, um, to little children, sometimes it's that moment where you're tucked up in bed with your little brother or sister or, or a baby and you can read them a story and you, you know, they're right here. And I love things that are soothing or the words are a bit like a river and they kind of roll over so there's different things I like reading for different moods sometimes if I'm at a preschool I love doing something that makes everybody sort of jump up and down and laugh and get excited maybe not run around too much if I'm at a school I like things that have a bit of message in them sometimes a bit of something to talk about afterwards um, but I love reading words that sound good and sound crunchy and just roll off your tongue. Sometimes you stumble when you read a book and the rhyme's not quite right. And that's that doesn't make me terribly happy. Um, and what do I like to write about? Pretty much everything. Anything that works as an idea, I'm keen to write about. So it's really just wrestling an idea to the ground and trying to get words on paper that make sense. Um, it's harder for me to draw everything because drawing is really hard. And I did this series of books with Stacey Gregg, who writes about horses and ponies quite a bit, who's an amazing writer. And I had to draw ponies and horses. And can I just say, ponies and horses are really hard. 
and they had to do four books and they were wearing costumes and they were having circuses and oh my goodness drawing is harder so there are some things I'd have to think twice about illustrating for people people are particularly hard to draw um I think to to get their expressions right um animals are easier because you can turn them into kind of fun characters um yeah Draw, drawing is harder for me so I write about anything as long as I don't have to illustrate it <laughs> um, when we were when we went out and recorded these we we did a little session where we read the book and we kind of talked about statues and we talked about questions to ask and there were actually quite a number of questions that the kids had that we didn't didn't quite make the video um, and so I'm just trying to think of a couple of them now but what you've just said was actually did come up as one of the questions um, one wow. of the kids asked do you draw your pictures do you copy them from a photo or do you draw them out of straight out of your imagination it's kind of a half and half because all illustrators generally go and find reference for what they want to draw so uh, say for instance thinking about that lion character i looked at all the lions that i already knew were in picture books for a start so there's the lion in the meadow by margaret mahi there's a library lion there's um oh there's heaps of them there's some modern ones you know, the lion, the witch in the wardrobe, Narnia, there's ways that lions have been drawn over time. And then there's historical references like the lion of Palmyra is a, a sculpture I really loved with a really characterful lion. You can look that one up because he's got a great face. Um, and then I tried sketching a version that was my lion so it didn't look like everyone else's. Uh, so you're not tracing or copying, but you're looking back and going, it's somewhere in this feeling that I'm trying to draw, like a little bit animated, a little bit proud, a little bit shifty. Um, and so that's the part of the drawing where you have to use your own brain and put in your own colors and your own characteristics and, and yeah, do, do the drawing part. So did that make sense? Yeah, mm -hmm. it does. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, that we've actually come finished the all the videos are all played, which is great. I'm pleased that we I hope that we've managed to fit them in so that they can be played for everyone to enjoy. Um, uh, I guess I do. Do you have any final questions, Meg? On the page, when you go from drawing a lion to the next page with the lion, would you cut and paste that same image to start you stop you creating it from scratch, or would you just start the mm. whole image? Fresh. You can, but if you're <clears throat> working in Procreate or Photoshop, or you know, in those things, you can you can keep your whole color palette set up so you know the color of the lion's eyes and the lion's mane and your shadows. So you can keep a color palette that swaps from page to page or drawing to drawing. Um, and you can keep your brushes, so that's going to keep a similar look. But you always have to redraw, I think, because you know your character is never going to be sitting in the same position again and again and again actually on a number of pages my lion was because when it goes in lion guards the cake he's pretty well sitting in the same spot so i could almost just change his eyeballs and maybe make him look as poor so i could use the same drawing then but most of the time i was trying to turn him around a little bit yeah. and that becomes really difficult because you can do one perfect drawing of a character sitting looking at the you know at the reader but the minute you try and draw them from behind or from the top or looking up under their chin, it gets really hard. You have to know the structure. And what a lot of illustrators do, I don't, but I probably should have, is they make a little sculpture out of putty, you know, out of um, oh, models of putty. Okay. Like lots of friends I know do that. And then they'll photograph that little sculpture, you know, yep. from where, what angle they want. And it'll just, it won't have any color on it or anything. And then they'll scan that and draw over that because they know how to keep yeah, the same the proportion that way. So they all model up a little character in, in oh, I don't know what you use because I don't do it, but modeling putty or something you can get from the craft shop. Um, so yeah, online, I think um, various artists who, yeah, take workshops and how you do that to make characters for, for drawings. Um, does that help? <laughs> does. Um, another question that was asked by one of the kids was, which I, great question. I'm, I'm sorry that we cut it out and didn't include it was, Whose cake was it? Well, I guess the cake, in my mind, just belonged to the people of the house. And if you look at the cake carefully, there's candles on it and there's five candles on it. Um, oh, so I'm figuring yeah, somebody yeah. was having a fifth birthday party at some point the next day. And 
you know, one of the things I was thinking about with the cake, because in the end, the lion tries to replace the cake, but he makes a really terrible cake. And that's partly to do with me. Um, and that when my boys were young, I'm that parent who everybody else would make an amazing cake, you know, with just beautiful things. And they'd make Thomas the Tank Engine looking perfect or whatever. And I'd go, oh my God, at midnight the night before and get in the kitchen and throw together some sponge and whatever else I could find and make a terrible, terrible cake. And fortunately, my kids never noticed because they just went, oh, it's covered in cream and sprinkles. So it's got to be good. Did it have broccoli sticking out of it? <laughs> no, it was sometimes it could have got that bad, but it didn't quite get that bad. So I figure it's just the cake that belongs to the people of the house. And in the morning on the very last second to last page, you'll notice that they're in the kitchen going, wow, what happened to the cake? Um, and in my secret imagination, in my real life, that would have been what my cake kind of looked like. And I'd just be going, no, no, it's a cake. It's a perfectly fine cake. What's wrong with okay. it? <laughs> nice. Um, I think that's the end of our questions and the end of all of the questions that I edited out of the videos. Um, cool. So we'd just like to say thank you so much for talking with us. We feel very special. We feel special yeah. that we got to see a little bit of outside, a little bit of in your house. Yeah. Larry. <laughs> Larry, I, I hope Larry makes it into your video, but he's just, he's obviously on a go slow this morning. He's going, no, no, no need to run anywhere today. Yeah. Warming up like a bumblebee. I'm wondering if he's mad he didn't make the, uh, make the book. I think he's working on a, on a book of his own. He's actually my neighbor's pet sheep and I adopted him. So he's nine years old and he's no longer Larry the lamb, but once upon a time he was Larry the lamb and now he's just Larry the old man and he sort of goes, <laughs> Every time he oh, marks, you know. Great storyline just there. <laughs> yeah, Larry the old man. We'll think about it. Yeah. <laughs> Next hey, year. Thank you for yeah. having me. And um, thank you to Anahira, Dayton, Anaru, Heath, Imokaya, and Kingston. And yeah, awesome. just really great fun to be here. So thanks for having me. Thank yeah, you. So lovely yeah. to meet you, Rose. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cheers. Thank you. Oh, okay. Like lots of friends I know do that. And then